So, we're continuing our almost there, crossing the ethnic divide. And today is going to be a little bit more personal, I guess, because it talks about, our passage in Acts 10, talks about not so much the advance of the gospel to many more people, but really the advance of the gospel in our heart, from the mind to the heart. And how it's not so easy to go out and share the gospel when there are heart issues that we need to contend with. So Acts chapter 10 is that story. As you understand, even sharing the gospel to anyone is already difficult. Sharing the gospel to people we know, even of our own culture, is already difficult. And so to think about crossing the ethnic divide and share the gospel to someone who's not even like us... It's doubly difficult, isn't it? I hope you do agree. And so, how do we contend with the Word of God that says we must make disciples of all nations? And that's not somehow inclusive of simply us, just like us. How do we overcome the barriers so that we indeed can cross the ethnic divide? If you look at your bulletin, my introduction talks about a spiritual heart bypass. You know, over the years of unhealthy diet, we produced blocked arteries that prevent blood to circulate properly. Some of you know that already, physically, right? But spiritually, it happens too. The procedure of a spiritual heart bypass is the only hope to an otherwise certain cardiac arrest, spiritually speaking. Now, in Acts 10, we have great company in Peter, Peter the Apostle. He didn't want to cross the ethnic divide. Ha, praise the Lord. We have company in the Bible. Peter himself. Something hindered him. He was repulsed at the thought. It would challenge his identity, challenge his own culture, challenge his own convictions. You know, if ever there was a chance to cross the bridge, God would make it happen. Because in Peter... It's not quite there. And so Acts chapter 10, I'm going to read verses 9 through 16 for our benefit this morning. Acts 10, verse 9. It begins this way. And on the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he beheld the sky opened up, and a certain object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. Verse 13. And a voice came to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. And this happened three times. And immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Dropping down to verse 34. And opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. This is God's word. May he embed its teaching and lesson and truth into our hearts this morning. I wonder whether you have had your children call you a racist. Have you? Yeah, we have. When we say a few things, um, naturally, we are somehow slapped on the hand, on the wrist, and said, that's racist. And they have a point. And we need to somehow listen and understand why. You know, preaching about the urgency of sharing the gospel to our neighbor is the easy part. But understanding the forces that prevent it from happening and then overcoming those forces are the hardest part. Parochialism. You know that word? Parochialism. Parochia, that we know. Parochialism is one of the powerful culprits. Like we are our own parish 
and everything else is outside. When we become so inclusive with our own church, so inclusive with our own culture, so inclusive with our own in-groups, guess what? A certain callousness builds around the walls, and we think there's only one way to look at things, my way. And so today we're going to look at this passage with a different set of eyes to understand what partiality, discrimination, hinders the progress of the gospel in my life, in your life, and even in a church's life. First of all, I want to mention some pitfalls of what I would call exclusive cliques. Exclusive cliques. The church can be an exclusive clique. My own group can be an exclusive clique. You can have your own groupings outside the church that can be so exclusive. And Peter actually had his own. And here, one of the pitfalls is this. There's a tendency to have this disobedient spirit, and I call it a spaced-out disobedience. If you look at verse 13, a voice came to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, By no means, Lord. So he knows it is God, it is Jesus speaking to him, commanding him very clearly, so simply, Peter, arise, kill and eat. It's such a simple command. But his response by no means, Lord. Just like that, without even thinking about it, it's so easy to simply disobey. Some translations say, absolutely not. Some say, never, Lord, or God forbid, Lord. And my translation is simply, over my dead body, Lord. I'm not going to do that. And that's the Lord speaking to him. Now, how can anyone have the audacity to say never to the Lord? Can you imagine that? It's so simple to say, I'm not going to do that, Lord. I mean, how easy it is when we are so inbred to say no, even to God himself, seemingly without a moment's reflection. Peter said no to Jesus' command. And my only somehow explanation for that is he must have been spaced out. You know, when we're so deep into our own culture, we hold on so tightly to all that's made who we are so tightly. And while there's some good to this, there's also a subtle yet insidious danger that lurks. It's called spiritual short-sightedness. It's called spiritual blindness. The same Peter actually learned this lesson. He says that when we no longer, when we no longer increase in moral excellence, in knowledge, in self-control, in perseverance, in godliness, brotherly kindness, and finally, if we no longer increase in love, love should increase. It's not kept stagnant. If we no longer increase in love, we are, Second Peter 1, 9, Peter talking, we are blind or short-sighted. Having forgotten, he was made clean from his former sins. Isn't that amazing? Peter learns a lesson. If we fail to love and that love increases to more and more people who are not so unlovable as we are, we are blind, short-sighted. We've forgotten the cleansing that has come from us. Some are unclean. Some are clean. Forgetting. We were unclean, now made clean. So there's a spaced out disobedience. There's spiritual arrogance as well. Verse 14 says, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. So you know the story, right? This vision of a white sheet, a huge sheet, carrying all kinds of animals, clean and unclean. Yet God said, do not call these things unclean. Those animals I have cleansed. And so that's what Peter sees in the vision. And so he simply says, I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. So here's what's behind an unbending attitude. Pride. You know, I've got this sterling record, Lord. I'm 40 years old, Peter. Maybe. Maybe he's saying, I'm 40 years old without pork. I've never touched anything profane in my life. I've been an orthodox, faithful, born-again Christian for so long. 
And that record won't be tarnished by unclean food. Never. The other way of saying this is, Lord, you know that I've been so clean and holy all my life. You know, Jesus must have laughed. Cultural ethnocentrism is a sin. Spiritual arrogance, the third pitfall is this. There's straightforward defiance. Look at verse 15. Again, a voice came to him a second time. He didn't get it the first time. Here's the second time. What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. You know, if I can just picture beef and uh, uh, what's his name in Back to the Future? No, the father. McFly, right? You know, beef and Mr. McFly, you know, he, he knocks on the head. Hello, can't you get it? And that's what Jesus is doing to Peter, knocking on his head because he doesn't get it. Did you hear what I said? Hello, what I asked you to eat is clean. That's how thick-skinned he's come to be within his own sacred traditions, built through the years of unexposure to any other world but his own, kept secure in the confines of his own righteous and royal group. That's it. In short... His inward orientation created a wall of quiet hostility to others. It's not a violent kind of hostility. It's just a quiet, creeping hostility. I'm better than you. I, I wouldn't touch that. I wouldn't even go near you. It's quiet. His way of doing things developed a righteous attitude that considered the outside group as lesser. And so he was arrogant and defiant Discrimination, in other words. And so the question for you and me this morning is this. How does that happen? Even to Peter. How does it happen that suddenly we discriminate? Suddenly my children call me a racist. How does that happen? I am not. But my words confirm that I am. And guess what? My words are what's in my mind. And that's how I look at other people. How does that happen? Well, I'm going to veer away from the text for now because I think it's important to talk about this. There is a pull towards discriminatory conduct in our lives. Always a pull towards discrimination. How does that happen? First, you've heard of this word before, stereotyping. Stereotyping is simply an oversimplification of a generalization. <laughs> what are those words? In other words, we tend to simplify what is a general thing we see. We make it wholesale, when in reality it's just retail. We make it true of everything else. We oversimplify a generalization. I don't know how many times, sometimes, when I introduce myself as a Filipino, and I would get a reply, oh, you must be a good singer. I mean, have, have you heard people say that to you? I mean, a non-Filipino, and when you say you're Filipino, they say, oh, you must be a great singer. Now, of course, I don't deny that. <laughs> right? Right, right. There you go. But obviously, not all Filipinos sing well, Right? You disagree? Okay. All right. Okay. But you know what I mean. We, we tend to make true everybody else in this simple statement. And examples abound. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I'll give you examples. All African Americans are great athletes. Not true. Again, it's a stereotype. How about this one? All Muslims, see, you're, you're already putting in the words, aren't you? Stereotype. Here's another one. All communists are right? Think about it. And the Bible has plenty of examples as well. For example, in John 1:46, Nathaniel, the apostle, speaking to Philip. Because Philip said, I think we've found the Messiah. 
He's Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathanael responds, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I mean, isn't that a stereotype? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Wow. And there's more. For example, in Titus chapter 1, verse 12, it goes like this. Paul writing to Titus, One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, he quotes something, he quotes a prophet, Cretans are all liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Wow. Acts 2.7 has the same thing. The people at Pentecost, remember the Jews, from all over the world, they were amazed and marveled because the apostles, the disciples of Christ, were speaking in foreign languages, right? And so all the people were amazed and marveled, saying, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And you know the implication, right? Galileans are uneducated. How can they even speak foreign languages? Well, they're not all uneducated. Some are not, right? And so you know what a stereotype is? We begin there, and we make true everybody else under that category. The second thing is this, prejudice. Prejudice, that's a little different from stereotype. Now, prejudice refers to beliefs. We begin to believe. We begin to have an opinion. We begin to have a certain attitude, certain thoughts, certain feelings about a group's superiority or inferiority based on color of skin, based on class, based on gender, and so many things else. So, prejudice, however, take this. It is not based on experience. That is why it is a pre-judgment. See, it's easier to be prejudiced than to gather the facts and know about a certain place, a certain person, right? It's easier just to listen to what people say. And generally, they're all slanted towards something. So here's an example of prejudice. James 2. My brethren... Do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. You know the story in James 2. What if somebody who's rich comes into your church and you favor the rich by giving the rich all the welcome that you can give, given the, the best place to sit on, given the best printed bulletin, you know, gi given, given the best kind of service simply because he's wealthy. Well, that's the story here, right? And then he ends in verse 4 with these words. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? You see, we have favored by class somebody else. That is prejudice. So don't favor one over the other on the basis of wealth or color, or race, or gender, etc. You can't believe that one is more superior and the other inferior. You see, at the end of James, it says this, following God, who is no respecter of persons. Have you heard, heard that statement? Who doesn't show partiality, basically. He doesn't respect. Of course, he respects. What I mean is he doesn't respect on the basis that you're more wealthy on the basis that you have a better color, on the basis that you have a better gender, or whatever it is. He doesn't respect all these man-made classifications and divisions. No partiality. So when we do have partiality, you know what we're doing in the church? We're creating what God has established as one and breaking them into parts, separating, creating division when God intends. The whole thing should be one. The New Testament is clear. There is no partiality with God. No prejudice whatsoever. And so the third thing is this. We begin to show that partiality that we act it out and therefore we discriminate. So discrimination is when we act out our prejudices for or against a group of people. You remember the story in Galatians 2. I mentioned it last week, I think. You remember Cephas or Peter again. That's why Peter's like us. In many ways, he's like me. You remember the story that Paul writes about? He says this, Before certain people from James, now you know James, James is like the senior pastor of the Jerusalem church. 
the mother church. And the mother church is made up of primarily Jewish believers. And so, this party that came from the Jerusalem church, who are all Jewish believers, it says here, they came, Cephas used to share meals with the Gentile outsiders, the Gentile believers in Galatia. And now he's learned this lesson. He's fellowshipping. He's koinoniaing, if there's such a word. He, he, he's right there with the Gentiles. And then, after they showed up, the Jewish believers from the mother church, Cephas suddenly became aloof, distanced himself from the outsiders, the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those believers who thought circumcision was necessary. Meron siyang pagkiling. Meron siyang kinikilingan na grupo doon maging sa iglesia ng ating Panginoon. Pagkiling. But they are all believers in Christ. But I would rather, because I'm afraid of you, actually he's not afraid of them, in his mind, they are more important. That's why he's afraid of them. Why is not he afraid of the Gentiles? He's afraid of them, which means he's formed an opinion that they are to be favored more than the others. And therefore, he's afraid of them, right? So he created prejudice in his own mind. And Paul himself stood him to the face and said, You are a man of hypocrisy. Two times. Discrimination works that way. And so let me back up a little bit and share about this idea of a single story. Because I think it's important for all of us. You know, as a child, I had American teachers in nursery. I read American books. I bought American PX products from Clark Air Base. You remember those days? Man, we really are old in this place. <laughs> we buy spam and all those kinds of things, right? Clark Air Base. I watched American cartoons. I wore Batman costume one Halloween year. White America to me back then is heaven. White America. You see, I had a single story of America. And it's a colonial mentality. Gaza bombs Israel. Gaza is Hamas hideout. Gaza is a terrorist city. Gaza is all about hatred. Good to bomb Gaza in response. A single story. Have you heard of stories of Christians in Gaza? Of Palestinian people who are Christians living in Gaza? Have you ever heard about, have you even Googled about them? You see, when we simply want to hear what we want to hear, it's simply a single story all the time. And we tend to blanket everybody else in that category. Actually, we have an example in Scripture. Jonah chapter 3. When God saw that the Ninevites repented, that they turned from their wicked way, then it says, God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them. Chapter 4 verse 1 begins with this. But it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. Why? Because he knew God was a merciful God. And he knew when he preached the gospel to the Ninevites, his mortal enemies, that they would repent. And they are not worthy of God's mercy. He was angry. I told you so. That's why I went for Tarshish and not to Nineveh. Single story. The Ninevites are bad. The Ninevites are ugly. The Ninevites are God 
forsaken. They're not worthy of anything. And when God says, don't look at the world like it's a binary world. This is my world. I have other sheep, not of your pen. I need to get to them too. The single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue. Stereotypes are incomplete. It's not the whole picture. And the consequence of a single story is this. It robs people of dignity. And so it's about time we reject the single story. Here's the single story of Peter and us all. All Gentiles, all our neighbors who are not like us, are unclean. I believe Gentiles are inferior to Jews. They are dogs. I won't make friends with Gentiles. I will not marry my children to less inferior people. Now replace the word Gentile with one of those you're prejudiced against. Democrat? African-American? Latino? If you're not Filipino, a Filipino. A Palestinian? How about a white American? There's plenty of things we can do to replace the word Gentile, the unclean, with the kinds of people we have a prejudice against. Put it in there and see what it's like. So there's always a pull towards discrimination in our hearts that we need to be careful of. And what we don't understand and realize is that the reason we are so closely knit in this is because we just don't want to go there. We develop our own walls to provide that protection. Instead, lots of doors of entry for others to come. So, number three, third observation is this. So, how do we change? How do I confront my prejudices? How do I confront my insular thinking of it's just us? How, how do I work it out such that you who are here know all the names of those who are here. And it still boggles me that in my time here in CICC, some of you still don't know the other. This is unbelievable to me. Do you know each other? I mean, can you name names, everybody here? Can you name the people at the tent? I hope you can. Because if you can't, it just shows how insulated your group has become. So how do we change? What's needed to get out of our insular lifestyle? Well, it's not all on us, thank God. God comes into the picture and breaks through because He knows we can't do it on our own. Here's what He does. There's a series of governed coincidences. <laughs> That's a, what do you call it? an oxymoron, you know, governed coincidences. You know, there's a disciple in Joppa. Now, some of you have been to Joppa, right? Some people here went to Joppa, right? You know where Joppa is? You know where Caesarea is? It's all by the coast of the Mediterranean. Well, there's this disciple in Joppa named Tabitha, Dorcas in Greek. And Tabitha died, and she's an influential disciple, now, Peter just happened to be nearby in Lydda, a nearby city. And the disciples in Joppa heard that Peter was around. And so they went to Peter somehow because they believed in his powers. Maybe he can do something about the dead Tabitha. And so Peter comes to Joppa. And Tabitha is raised from the dead. And because of that, many believe because of the power that was residing in Peter, raising a dead person to life, many believed, and because many believed, he had to stay longer. And guess what? 
he stayed in a place. The landlord was Simon the Tanner. Now, some of you have been there too, right? Simon the Tanner. Simon the Tanner? Yes, very good. We're going to go there soon. All right? So, Simon the Tanner. Now, underline Tanner. Because for Luke, it's important that the inscription, the Tanner, is right there. Why? Because when Peter comes to this home, he sees skinned, I mean, animals that have been skinned, clean and unclean, all skinned. And so, he's right there. He sees all the skins. He smells all the skins. It's a mixture of clean and unclean. Well, one day at noon, at the rooftop of this house, his tummy begins to rumble. He's hungry. Noontime. And so you see Tabitha. And then you have the tanner. And now his tummy. Now, no one can actually put that all together but God, right? And so it's governed. Coincidence, but it's governed by God. His tummy begins to rumble. He's hungry. He falls into a trance. That's the fourth T. Trance. Now, only God can do that. He breaks through his existence, and then he shows this vision of the linen with all these unclean animals made clean by God. And he says, kill and eat. God organizes your circumstances in order for you to be confronted with a mirror of your heart to see what's in there and to grapple with it. The second thing that happens here, of course, again, the flash of golden calves. What do you mean by that? The sheet. This is Peter's golden calf. This is what Peter idolized in his life. This is what he held on to more than God in his life. He said, I'm not going to follow you, Lord. This is what I follow. This is my golden calf. I will not touch anything unclean. And so there's a flash of golden calves. He's confronted. God shows us our blind spots, and he does that through his word, through the Spirit's voice, and through our everyday circumstances. And for Peter, all three converged. The word of God, the Spirit of God, and his circumstances confronted him with the truth of his idols. And so he had to do something about it. Mirrors all around him to shed light on that calloused, closed heart that only cared for his own and shut out everything outside and called them all unclean. There's a flash of our own golden calf. There's more to it. And there's the echoes of grace calls in his life. Verse 16, this happened three times. Now you wonder, why three? Why not five? Why even include the repetition? Three times. And then immediately, the object was taken up into the sky. See, he still doesn't get it. It, it tells us he was still reflecting on it, figuring out what was this all about. Yet three times it happened. And then, of course, the next thing is there are three people waiting downstairs because you know the story, Cornelius uh, in Caesarea had a vision. Go to, go pick up Simon, Peter, bring him to yourself. And so he sent three of his own servants down to Joppa. And so Peter is reflecting three times. Why, Lord, three times? And then he's asked, go downstairs. There's three men, unclean, because they're all from the Roman cohort. They're all soldiers. And so here, three times this happened. Three unclean men are waiting below, bringing back memories of his threefold denial. Threefold forgiveness and a threefold, do you love me? I mean, do you, do you really love me? I mean, I mean, it's easy to say, of course I love you. But here's the practical application of it. Do you love your neighbor? Whom I have cleansed, just like I've cleansed you? Do you? Here's three unclean men. And I think by this time, grace was beginning to soften his heart, calling him back to where he came from. 
grace and mercy and forgiveness and love. And so finally, there's the breach of guardrails. Verse 20, but arise, go downstairs, accompany them without misgivings. You know that word, misgivings? Accompany them without making judgments. It's almost your word for prejudice. Go down to them, accompany them without prejudice. For I have sent them myself. And so he invited them in. He invited them in unclean and gave them lodging. Verse 28. When now he goes to Cornelius in Caesarea with these men, he said to all of them, Now you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. This is illegal in my Jewishness. This is illegal under the Jewish law. What I'm doing is not right. You know that. Yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. Mind and heart are now wide open. Hospitality has broken through. And let me say this. Not until we're able to invite a neighbor, not quite like you and me. It's not until we're able to invite a neighbor will relationships take on a new level. There's something about hospitality that changes the way you relate to your neighbor. Try it and see the difference. So instead of parties, celebrations among us all the time, try to invite your neighbor who's not like you. Bring someone along, not just you. Bring another neighbor who's part of us here with you, but invite somebody else to your place. I'll tell you what, your relationship with that person is going to change. It's not going to be the same because you've made an effort to make friends. That's different. And so I'm going to end. You know, I'm getting quicker with my sermons. This is good. <clears throat> I'm going to end with two things. Number one, so beware our sacred cows. You know what a sacred cow is? Sacred cows are like golden calves. Some things we hold on to dearly that it became sacred to us that we cannot let go of such things. What imprisons you? Have we gone overboard and made sacred our lives within insulated groups? Are we guilty of prejudice of others simply because they don't eat our food simply because they're not like us, simply because they have a different smell, different color of skin, different lifestyle. What's the sacred cow that prevents you from breaking free to love your neighbor, not just one another, but your neighbor? You see, when we reject the single story, when we realize there is never a single story about any person, then the paradise that was lost might be regained. Beware our sacred cows. Here's the second. Behold our sacred vows. You see, if we claim to be truly a follower of Christ, and we know the great commandment, Love God with all that you are and your neighbor as yourself. If we profess that to be our way of life, then great. It is a sacred vow. But let me ask you this thing because our love needs to increase, as Peter says. It's not, a, it's not as if we've reached the ultimate love and we're there. It needs to keep increasing as we follow the Lord. 
And so have you set your own limits in following him? I will only follow you here in this church. I'm going to follow you and love here in this church. This is enough for me. Outside of a Sunday, outside of this church, I'm following me. What's your sacred vow? Have you promised to be salt and light of the earth? Have you promised to love God and neighbor? You know, James continues on in chapter 2 about partiality, and he says this. If you are fulfilling the royal law, and the royal law is this, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the royal law. If you are fulfilling the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin. If we show partiality because they're not part of us, sin has entered our lives. James 2, 8 and 9. So don't let good things prevent you from being the best God wants you to do. That's what I'm after. There's so many good things we're doing. But he wants us to increase. He wants us to grow. He wants us to understand what real love is, and it must increase. It's not kept. It's scattered. It's given to more and more people. I told you the story before. I had a next-door neighbor. Had. Her name is Aunt Alberta. That's what we call her. She's a single, widowed grandmother. She lives by herself. She's African-American. We befriended her. We invited her for dinner over Christmas and other occasions. I think our pastors have come to know her. And so we're there with her. We became friends, very good friends. We share about our faith, our church. We, we share about everyday living and how difficult it is to drive as an old lady, always having to call the sheriff in order to warn them that he's, she's driving. And there she, she talks about her life, and we love her. Well, there was a time when suddenly we, we, we couldn't see her. I mean, well, she wasn't going out of her home anymore. And we got concerned because where is she? Did she go on a vacation? Because she didn't have any relatives as well. The nearest relative is from Oklahoma. And so we wondered, well, where is she? So finally, we were calling out. We were, we were ringing the, the bell, the doorbell, and we couldn't figure out where she was. And, and so we looked we entered her back, her fence, I mean, her, her, her gate at the back, and I looked into what I can look at from a window, and then I saw legs splattered on the floor at the kitchen. I couldn't see the hole, but I said, that must be her. She's laying flat. We'll go to the front door to look at her front door with, with massive uh, glass that's, that's somehow... Um, what do you call it? It, it, it? It's decorated glass, right? It, it's hard to look through, but we could see on the side it was her on the floor. Called 911, and they came immediately. They broke open the front door, and they, she, and they pronounced her dead. Probably 24 hours already. Ushered unto glory. I was glad I had a friend like Aunt Alberta. We were the only ones at her funeral at Rose Hills among the neighborhood. Everybody else was foreign. Some relatives came from Oklahoma and said, Pastor, can you share a word of prayer? I sure can. Aunt Alberta, you know, something changes when you bring our neighbors in. Relationships change. How you respect one another changes. You learn from other cultures. And our lives do not narrow, narrow, and narrow down. But it keeps on expanding so that our love can keep on growing and increasing, loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. 
You see, it's not so easy to simply cross the ethnic divide because sometimes the divide is in your heart. And until we understand how to cross that divide of prejudice, stereotyping, holding on to golden calves and sacred cows, until we understand those, we will never cross this ethnic divide. What will it take for you? I trust that the Holy Spirit will work in your life, that you'll do something about it to the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, here we are. We are yours. We call you our Savior and Lord. We follow you with all of our being. And today, what a challenge. Because somehow we see gaps, a gulf so wide that it's not, not even external. It's not a gulf that we see by our everyday eyes. It, it's a gulf deep within our soul. Because deep within, we've divided. We've called others this way. We've somehow minimized others because we love our own. We love one another where we are. We grow where we are, but it's just so darn hard to look at our hearts and be asked, why aren't you crossing? plenty of excuses but none of them can ultimately excuse us the royal law love your neighbor as yourself without partiality we thank you because your Holy Spirit is the great miracle worker he mends our hearts he shows us the truth about the state of our being. And because of your grace and mercy, Lord, it's okay. It's okay to be offended by the truth. If only we hear you again. If only we, we get moved from our state of comfort. And so work in us. And thank you for the miracles you'll do. Not us, but to you will be all the glory because we can't do it. Humanly impossible, yet mysteriously doable because we are not alone. Jesus, our shepherd, goes with us. And so thank you for what you will do, the miracles you'll perform, in our individual lives miracles in our individual families yes Lord help us to multiply miracles we'll see even here in this church and so we thank you and we return to you even now by faith our thanksgiving and our praise because you We'll work it out, and we will simply follow. Thank you, Lord.